This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first kickoff conference of our Heart and Vascular Grand Round series. Um, I've been working with uh, Stefan Rinfred, uh, Olga Toliva, and Gautam Kumar, as well as our CT surgery um, colleagues, Dr. Mike Halkos, to uh, organize these this year, and very excited to start off uh, another, another year. Um, thank you for those of you also who have emailed me. If you have uh, speakers that you'd like us to invite, just shoot me an email and we'll do our best to try to fit them in. Um, Robbie Williams also wanted me to announce that our cardiology fellows conference starts this Friday. So look out for those emails, uh, that's by Zoom. Um, so just uh, try to attend those. They're, they're put together by our um, cardiology fellows. Okay, so um, today it's my pl pleasure to introduce Dr. Alana Morris. She doesn't actually need any introduction. All of us know Dr. Morris, and it's hard to find any, um, you know, as I go through and get these invitations for different conferences, I always see Dr. Morris's picture everywhere, and I'm always wondering, her office is right next to mine, and I'm always wondering how she's able to give so many talks and, and still stay so productive. Um, so she's an associate professor and a heart failure specialist and also directs the heart failure research here at Emory. She attended Harvard Medical School and did her internship and residency at the Brigham, followed by the clinical investigator track fellowship here at Emory, and then did an advanced heart failure fellowship year. She also completed a master's in clinical research. She's very active within the ACC, AHA, Heart Failure Society, of America, and is on a lot of uh, committees. Uh, and also on Scientific Statements Committee. She's on the editorial board of CERC Heart Failure, Journal of Cardiac Heart Failure, and also co-investigator on several NIH-funded um, grants. They're focusing on heart failure research, disparities, precision medicine, metabolomics. And uh, so who else but Dr. Morris to tell us about the updated um, heart failure guidelines that came out earlier this year. I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Thank you, um, Dr. Mehta. So I have a bunch of slides. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them in the next hour, um, but I encourage people to ask questions because our, our field has really changed, I think, dramatically in the last, you know, even three to four years. And the good news is we have a lot of options to treat patients. The bad news is we have a lot of options to treat patients. And so making uh, clinical decisions, I think in practice versus actually reading the guidelines um, become two very different things. But still, I think knowing the guidelines and where we are is extremely important. So. Um, these are my disclosures, and the learning objectives really are to sort of try to break this down in terms of looking at the guideline-based evidence for care of patients with reduced EF heart failure, now talking about the way the treatment pathways have changed for patients who are now classified as mildly reduced or preserved EF heart failure, and then finally understand updated evidence for the care of patients with advanced heart failure. So, um, I mean, it's no secret, right, that this uh, condition is one that we'll continue to see more and more and more of. You know the prevalence of heart failure is increasing because of the advancing age of the population as well as for the increasing burden of cardiometabolic risk factors. But at this point, there's at least 6.2 million U.S. adults living with heart failure. The lifetime risk after the age of 40 is about one in five. Um, and we know that 50% of heart failure patients will die within five years diagnosis. So we talk a lot about sort of the idea that heart failure tends to be worse than many cancers. And yet when we look at the data, these patients are extremely undertreated and we're trying to change that. This is the number one cause of hospitalization in adults over the age of 65. It's actually the third most common diagnosis related group within Emory Healthcare. And at this point, the 30 day readmission rate is still hovering at about 24%. And at one year, about 60% of these patients will come back to the hospital. So these patients are at extremely high risk for bad outcomes. And this is a nice slide from Stephen Green, who's now an assistant professor at Duke. And, and he's worked a lot with Greg Fonero and Javid, just sort of, again, trying to classify risk in this patient population. I think for years, many of us have been trained to think about coronary disease and preventing ASCVD as a primary uh, sort of thing that we do in our clinical practice, and that's extremely important. But when you put ASCVD risk uh, in sort of proportion with heart failure risk, you can see that patients with heart failure are so much higher risk for bad outcomes as compared to even patients with ASCVD, probably with an exception of you know, acute anterior STEMI. Again, if you sort of look at the ASCVD guidelines for lipids and others, um, these patients, you know, probably when we're looking at events, event rates of up to 7%, but when you look at 
heart failure patients, even ones that we classify as stable outpatients. And again, we wanna to try to remove this terminology related to stability as it pertains to heart failure patients. Even the most stable heart failure patient, if you will, is already sort of out of proportion of an ASCVD patient. And when you look at patients who've had recent hospitalizations or worsening heart failure, which is when we often come into contact with them for the first time, their risk goes up substantially compared to other patients. So we really have to get into the thought of understanding that these patients, particularly the ones who we encounter in a hospitalized setting, are at extremely high risk for bad outcomes. And yet, despite that knowledge, when we look at the data for treatment of these patients, they are grossly undertreated. This, again, is an analysis from Stephen Green and others from the CHAMP HF registry, which is mostly cardiology practices and the outpatient setting. And this is based on sort of prior treatment guidelines. How many of these patients are being treated with RAS inhibitors, ACE, ARB, ARNI, evidence-based beta blockers, or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists? And when you look at this data, we can see that about 26% of patients who don't have a documented contraindication are not on an ACE and ARB or an ARNI. Um, over a third of patients um, are not on an evidence-based beta blocker, even though they don't have a documented contraindication. And almost two thirds of patients are not on an MRA, even though they don't have a documented contraindication. So I think what this analysis did, and it's been sort of cited over and over and over again, is that we can do better in both the outpatient and the inpatient setting in terms of getting these patients on drugs that we know reduce that high level of morbidity and mortality. And yet, despite that, these guidelines have changed. So we're sort of past the days of thinking about just ACE, ARP, RNA, beta blocker, and MRA as the foundation of therapy. Earlier this year, the 2022 heart failure guidelines were published. These are some nice slides that were published by the Journal of Cardiac Failure. You can actually download um, these offline. For those of you who are putting together presentations, there won't be time to actually talk about the top 10 take home messages, but I will sort of go through those. Um, and we'll go through a few of them in detail. So I think the first thing is that GDMT for HEFRAF at this point includes four classes of medications with the SGLT2 inhibitor being the newest add-on. Um, we also now see this new classification again of mildly reduced EF heart failure and SGLT2 inhibitors have a 2A recommendation in mildly reduced EF. There's new recommendations for HEF-PEF, including the SGLT2 inhibitors, MRAs, and ARNI. We're now recognizing this new uh, category uh, called improved EF heart failure. These are patients who previously were classified as HEF-REF, but usually with GDMT or other treatment paradigms, their EF is now greater than 40. And the take home for these patients is that they should continue HEF-REF treatment unless there is sort of a clear and compelling reason to take them off. We have randomized data from the TREAD-HF study showing that when you withdraw GDMT from this patient population, almost half of them will actually go back to having either biomarker or clinical evidence of heart failure within six months. So it's really important to continue GDMT in this patient population. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about the new heart failure guidelines is that they also um, put value statements for um, areas where we have high quality cost effectiveness data because we know that many of these newer drugs are expensive. So I think as clinicians, when we're talking to patients, oftentimes we are trying to talk about cost, but there actually is good cost effectiveness data for many of these drugs. Um, Amyloid has new recommendations for screening, testing, and treatment. We know Dr. Bott has the number one YouTube video for discussion about amyloids. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but it's worth reviewing that pathway in the new guidelines. Um, the uh, evidence also supports documenting increased filling pressures for patients with a heart failure diagnosis when the EF is greater than 40%, um, and we can use biomarker testing to do that. These are the um, take-home messages that I'm going to concentrate on today. Going through the remaining messages, um, patients with advanced heart failure who wish to prolong survival should be referred to a team specializing in heart failure, including palliative care, consistent with the patient's goals of care, and we'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about that patient population. Um, it's also important to realize that there's a new universal definition of heart failure that kind of re-termed the old ACC AHA stage A as patients at risk for heart failure, as well as those who were old ACC AHA stage B as pre-heart failure with the new sort of addition that we should be checking biomarkers, either natriuretic peptides or troponin in that patient population, because we now have drugs that can prevent the onset of heart failure, particularly the SGLT2 inhibitors. So thinking about treating those patients who are at risk for pre-heart failure to try to prevent the onset of stage C in the same way that we try to prevent ASCVD is extremely important. And of course, there's a host of other recommendations for treatment of iron deficiency with or without anemia, hypertension, sleep disorders, type two diabetes, but we will not have uh, time to go through all of that. So let's focus on um, first contemporary treatment of HEFREF. So again, we've now established this concept of foundational therapy for HEFREF are these four pillars 
That would include the ARNI, although ACE inhibitors and ARBs are, are perfectly fine. Those are still class one. An evidence-based beta blocker, an MRA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor, of which there are two that are currently FDA approved for the treatment of heart failure. I think the take home is that the benefits of these drugs actually start within the first 30 days of starting these therapies. And, and there's evidence, clinical trial-based evidence showing, particularly with the RNA and the SGL2 inhibitor, that we can start patients on these drugs in the hospital. It's safe. It's actually a good time to do it because we can observe what happens to their blood pressure, their renal function. And this is a nice slide from Greg Fonero that shows that if you look at cumulative risk reduction in all cause mortality, over 24 months, if patients were on all of these drugs, the relative risk reduction um, as compared to only two drugs is about 73%, and the absolute risk reduction is about 25%, with the number needed to treat of about four. So again, sort of going back to the guidelines, there's a nice um, treatment pathway that I've shown you here. It's relatively complex, and I think a lot of us are familiar with this. But again, sort of breaking this down by step one, the first thing is really to try to initiate foundational for drug therapy for patients with HEFRAF. Again, and ARNI in those patients who are NYHA two and three, we do have a trial, the LIFE trial that we participated in here at Emory showing in patients who are NYHA four, there's actually not a benefit over um, ARB therapy. So if patients are NYHA two or three, um, use the ARNI again, unless there's a compelling reason not to do so an evidence-based beta blocker in MRA or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And of course, for patients who have um, evidence of pulmonary systemic congestion to use diuretics. Um, again, this sort of concept of the ARNI as the preferred RAS inhibitor, I think is still new for us. I think we're doing this much, much more in cardiology clinic. If you look at other practice settings like internal medicine or others, um, I think there's still somewhat of a reluctance to put patients on ARNI. Um, but the guidelines do tell us that for patients who are tolerating an ACE or an ARB, that replacing those with an ARNI is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality. And this is actually considered high value. So even though the out-of-pocket cost for patients for an ARNI is significantly greater than for an ACE or an ARB, based on the reduction in both mortality and hospitalization that we see in patients who are placed on an ARNI as compared to older generation drugs like ACEs and ARBs, this still provides high economic value. So let's go through the data for that. Um, we know that this started back in 2014 with the publication of Paradigm HF, of course, patients were randomized head to head. The treatment with enalapro versus acubitravalsartan at the time, this was the largest heart failure study that had been done over 8,000 patients, EF less than or equal to 40%. And the primary outcome, of course, was a composite of uh, CV death and heart failure hospitalization. But what was exciting about this trial was not only the 20% relative risk reduction, in that primary outcome, but all of the secondary endpoints, including CV death, heart failure, hospitalization, and all-cause death were all reduced for patients who were randomized to the ARNI compound versus enalapril. So again, this concept of head-to-head -head comparison showing the superiority of secubitril valsartan. Since that time, there have been a number of trials that have been done to sort of see what other populations we can expand uh, into, the first of which being Pioneer HF. So many of the criticisms of Paradigm, were th these were patients who were stable. Again, outpatients, there was this run-in period, as you know, where patients had to prove that they could tolerate the highest dose of both enalapril as well as acubitral valsartan to get into Paradigm. So we went back and we said, okay, let's do a different trial in a sicker patient population. So that was Pioneer. So it's a much smaller trial, only about 880 patients. This was done in North America. Um, again, EF less than or equal to 40%. Again, randomized to acubitral valsartan or enalapril during a hospitalization for acute heart failure. And so the investigators gave us a careful dose titration algorithm. We could start at the lowest dose and titrate up based on blood pressure and tolerance. And remember that this was the first hospitalization for heart failure in about a third of these patients and about 50% had never been on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. They were naive to those drugs. If you look at the primary outcome, it was only powered to show a reduction in NT-pro BNP over an eight week treatment period. And you can see that in the figure on the left. However, one of the exciting things about Pioneer was that if you look at the secondary endpoint of rehospitalization for heart failure, which the trial was not actually powered to show, there was almost a 50% relative risk reduction. So again, sort of establishing not only the safety of this drug, but the potential benefit to patients who are hospitalized at the time that we initiate therapy. And of course, at the time, we were very, very worried about things like blood pressure, worsening renal function, hyperkalemia. Even in this very sick patient population, when you look at those key safety outcomes, like worsening renal function, hyperkalemia, symptomatic hypotension, and of course, angioedema, they were equivalent between the two treatment groups. So this was one of the first studies, I think, that established the idea that we can start this drug in the hospital, we can start it in patients who are decompensated, and it's safe and it's okay to do and still improves outcomes. I think another trial that's really important is a Prove HF study. So this was an open label 12 month prospective study putting patients with HFRF at about 80 outpatient sites in the US 
on sativa travol sartan to look at its effect on cardiac remodeling because we've got so much good data with ACE inhibitors in particular, as well as ARB showing the effects on uh, cardiac remodeling in this patient population. So you can see what happens to the EF over that 12 month treatment period. These patients started with a mean EF at about 28% and it actually went up to a mean of about 38% after 12 months of treatment. But the other thing is if you look at all of the other secondary uh, values like LV and diastolic volume index, systolic volume index, left atrial volume index, as well as the EDE prime as a marker of filling pressures, those all improved over the 12 month treatment period as well. All of these comparisons from baseline to 12 months are statistically significant. And I think that the exciting thing or the really interesting thing about PREB-HF was that 98% of these patients were already on a beta blocker at the time that they enrolled and 75% were on an ACE or an ARB. So again, showing that even in the patients who were on sort of standard GDMT at that time, that we still saw a significant improvement in EF as well as all of these other uh, uh, cardiac remodeling parameters sort of over baseline therapy with an ACE or an ARB. So that's really the data that has established this idea that the ARNI is the preferred RAS inhibitor, assuming that patients can tolerate it hemodynamically and assuming that patients can afford it, which is sort of an important but separate conversation. The other new kid on the block, of course, is the SGLT2 inhibitors. And I think that we are all getting more familiar with, with starting these drugs and using them. Um, they're actually a relatively easy uh, drug to start and use. There's no titration involved, 10 milligrams a day for both empagliflozin as well as dacliflozin, but we'll go through that data. Um, and we know that initially these drugs were thought of as, as diabetes drugs, and we now have FDA approval for both diabetes, CKD, as well as heart failure. And what's been interesting is to sort of see the benefit of these drugs in multiple different spaces that we didn't initially anticipate. We know that when these patients start these drugs, they often get an osmotic diuresis because they're no longer absorbing both glucose and sodium in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we see reductions in cardiac preload, blood pressure, improvements in systolic function and diastolic function. But there's sort of been all these off-target effects that have made people kind of call these pleiotropic drugs in the same way that we think about statins. So decreases in uric acid, improvements in uh, myocardial utilization of ketones and other metabolites besides free fatty acids, improvements in glucose and insulin resistance, decreases in inflammation, as I mentioned, improvements in naturesis, uh, decreases in albuminuria. We know that these patients often, again, have a diuresis that improves their edema, as well as some improvements in endothelial function, reductions in blood pressure, and even improvements in hemoglobin and or hematocrit. So just a host of, of benefits that we're still starting to understand. We now have two very well done, large randomized trials in patients with HEF-REF. So the first was DAPA-HF published in 2019. Patients were randomized to dapagliflozin versus placebo on top of standard GDMT, showing about a 25% relative risk reduction in those patients who were randomized to dapagliflozin. A year later, we saw a very similar outcome in patients uh, who were in emperor reduced. So again, same study design. Empagliflozin versus placebo, looking at a primary outcome of CV death and heart failure hospitalization, exact same relative risk reduction, so about 25%, and those patients who were randomized to empagliflozin versus those who were on placebo. And it's important to sort of acknowledge that those outcomes were similar with or without comorbid diabetes. A lot of times, you know, people, especially in primary care settings or others will ask, well, do you see hypoglycemia? There's actually been some pharmacology studies that have tested these drugs up to a dose of like 500 milligrams in patients who are non-diabetic and you really don't see hypoglycemia in those patients. I think one of the things as cardiologists, or at least I struggle with sometimes is what to do with their other drugs. So what to do with their insulin, particularly in outpatient setting. And I think for me, there's been a lot of communication with primary care clinicians as well as nephrologists to make sure that we're adjusting other medicines accordingly. So if you look at sort of the totality of data, because we don't actually have a trial at this point that shows the benefit of four drug therapy, even though that is the recommendation for patients with HEFRAF. What we do have is this really interesting analysis that was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, <clears throat> using data from Emphasis, DAPA, HF, Paradigm, um, looking at sort of the benefit of four drug therapy as comprehensive therapy versus conventional therapy and ACE and R plus an evidence-based beta blocker. So what is the benefit that patients get when you put them on four drug therapy versus conventional therapy? And this is what this analysis shows. So if you look at event-free survival defined by CV death or heart failure hospitalization for a 55-year-old, 
you can actually buy them over eight years of event-free survival by putting them on four drug therapy as compared to two drug therapy. Even for an 80 year old, you're getting over three years of additional event-free survival. So very, very compelling data. If you look just at survival alone, even forgetting about heart failure hospitalization, over six years of additional survival for uh, a 55 year old. And again, a little over two years of additional survival for an 80 year old. So these drugs are beneficial. They're extremely important. Um, but I don't want to say that there's not some costs related to the drugs, right? So I think we've been trying to do this in a clinic, clinical setting, and we know that sometimes getting all of these drugs on board can be difficult for a variety of reasons. This was a nice paper that was published earlier this year looking at sort of what they called the spending function, right? So trying to get patients on four drugs as opposed to two or three. And we know that when we talk about blood pressure, renal function, heart rate, and other factors, hyperkalemia, that sometimes it can be tricky and difficult clinically to apply these guidelines to real world patients. The other thing that Dr. Clements and I were talking about before we started, of course, is cost, because ARNI as well as SGLT2 inhibitor are both uh, brand name. There's no generic alternative at this point. I'm not actually sure when the ARNI will become generic, but even when it does, there's actually not a competitor, there's not another competitor in that class of drugs. So I think at this point, many of us are having conversations about the cost of these therapies with our patients much more so than we were when all of these drugs were generic and on the $4 Walmart list. That being said, I think it's very difficult to argue with the benefits, at least based on the clinical trial data that I show you. And this is something that I think we're gonna to have to do more and more in clinical practice to sort of weigh both the cost benefit as well as the issues related to blood pressure and just tolerance of all of these other drugs. How to do this actually is another um, sort of thing that's covered in the guidelines. Um, so the other thing that's important about sort of getting patients on these drugs is not just starting them, but titrating to the doses that we know have been effective in clinical trials. So that's step two is rapid initiation as well as titration. The guidelines actually tell us um, that uh, it's a class of recommendation one to titrate GDMT to achieve the target doses shown to be efficacious efficacious in RCTs, and that we want to actually do it frequently. You don't want to put somebody on an RNA and say, hey, I'll see you back in six months. We actually want to try to bring them back within one to two weeks if possible. That could be done via telemedicine. This might be a place where telemedicine could be very helpful. And depending upon the patient's symptoms, vital signs, and lab findings, continue to try to up titrate the dose. There's been a lot of discussion about sort of what we used to do, which is usually starting a patient on an ACE or an ARB and then bringing them back in a few months, starting a beta blocker, then starting an MRA and then starting an ARNI. And, and some of us are still sort of trying to get patients to max dose Coreg, for example, before adding on another drug. And the idea now is that we really don't wanna do that, that we wanna do rapid sequencing. Um, this is one uh, sort of thought or paradigm as to how we could do this to maybe start if you have someone who has de novo or a new diagnosis of acute heart failure or chronic or, or, or you know, new systolic heart failure in the outpatient setting, that perhaps starting the beta blocker and an SGLT2 inhibitor first at the same time. For the most part, DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced have shown us that the SGLT2 inhibitors in particular are relatively hemodynamically neutral. We don't see a lot of blood pressure lowering, at least in HEFREF patients from starting those drugs. And then perhaps coming back in a couple of weeks and adding on the ARNI and then adding on the MRA or vice versa. There's also some interesting data showing that if you put patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor first, that that reduces the risk of hyperkalemia associated with the addition of the MRA. So there's a lot of potential ways to do this. I think the thing for us to remember is that it's important to try to do it as rapidly as possible, assuming that the patient is tolerating these drugs in terms of hemodynamic or other side effects. So what if you have a patient who still has persistent symptoms once they're already on four drug therapy? <clears throat> then what do you do? Um, and here's a place where, again, we still have some oldies but goodies like hydrology and nitrates, as well as some newer therapies that we can consider adding on. So step four is to consider additional therapies and implement additional GDMT for patients who either don't tolerate four drug therapy or still have persistent symptoms in spite of four drug therapy. This is an editorial that Javid Butler and I put together after these guidelines were published, just sort of comparing the 2022 AHA ACC HFSA heart failure guidelines to the ESC guidelines that were published the year before. There are some differences. Again, one of the discordant recommendations, I suppose, is that the US guidelines are, again, putting the ARNI on top as the preferred RAS inhibitor as compared to ACE inhibitors or ARPs. Um, another difference is that the ESC guidelines actually downgraded hydrology and isosorbide because of the lack of evidence in patients who are not self-reporting as black. But it's important for us to remember that the US guidelines still keep hydrology and isosorbide, as you saw, as a class one. 
There's also interesting a lower level of recommendation in the ESC guidelines for primary prevention ICD in patients with non-ischemic heart failure, mostly because of the Danish trial and some other trials that have sort of shown that maybe primary prevention ICDs are not as beneficial as what we saw in Scudheft and other, other trials, older trials. And I think the thought there is that now that our, our GDMT for HEFRAF has evolved and the event rate for these patients is starting to come down, that there may need to be a reassessment of, of where the benefit of primary prevention ICDs are, particularly for patients with non-ischemic heart failure. So stay tuned. We may see some more data in that realm, but I think it's going to take a couple of years. And then the other thing, as I mentioned, is that the value statements associated with these drugs um, was put sort of in the forefront for the 2022 guidelines, but value really was not addressed at all in the ESC guidelines. So what are the additional options for patients who have persistent symptoms on four drug therapy or even worsening despite four drug therapy? Well, again, there's still a couple of options. Many of these are familiar. Um, Ivabradine for patients who uh, have HEFRAF with a heart rate above 70 beats a minute on a maximally tolerated dose of beta blocker. I think that's the key thing. They have to be in sinus rhythm heart rate above 70 on a maximally tolerated dose of beta blocker. So before I reach for evabridine, I usually try to ask myself, can these patients um, uh, tolerate any up titration of their beta blockade? Verisiglot is another new kid on the block, which we'll talk about a little bit. And of course, DIG is still a 2B polyunsaturated fatty acids or a 2B, as well as some evidence for potassium binders, which are now recommended to hopefully allow us to get patients who have a history of hyperkalemia on an MRA back on that MRA so that they can accrue the benefits of either spironolactone or oxirantone. So we'll talk about these in a little bit of detail since again, those are, are probably newer for some of us. The SHIFT HF trial is actually over 10 years old at this point. I think most of us are comfortable and familiar with this uh, drug compound, but for those of you who aren't, the idea was that in many um, sort of older large cohort and observational studies, elevated heart rate has been associated with increased mortality but we know that sometimes titrating beta blockers up for these patients to achieve heart rate reduction is not possible because of the hypotensive side effects, the negative inotropy and other effects. So Ivabradine was a newer drug. It inhibits the sodium, uh, sodium current in the sino sinoatrial node. And so in the SHIFT HF uh, trial, over 6,000 patients were randomized um, to Ivabradine versus placebo. These were patients with class two, three, and four heart failure and an EF of 40% or less. And you can see about an 18% relative risk reduction in those patients who were randomized to Ivabradine. And that was driven by mostly a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. There was no impact on CVDF. Verisigwad is one of the other newer drugs, um, again, that can be an add-on therapy, particularly for patients with worsening heart failure. This is an interesting compound. Um, it's a novel oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. So we know in patients who have heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, they tend to get endothelial dysfunction uh, because of uh, increases in oxidative stress, increases in inflammation. And what that does is it uh, decreases the amount of circulating NO that's available. NO is needed to activate soluble guanylate cyclase to stimulate GTP to stick with GMP. And so because of the uh, reductions in nitric oxide that we see in these patients, we don't get all of the benefits of cyclic GMP, like improvements in myocardial as well as vascular dysfunction. So what Verisigwat does is it actually directly stimulates soluble guanylate cyclase independent of NO. It actually also sensitizes soluble guanylate cyclase to endogenous NO. So it sort of works in two kind of slick pathways to make sure that we get this conversion of GTP to cyclic GMP, then getting all of those beneficial effects on both myocardial as well as vascular function. So this concept was tested in the Victoria trial. Uh, in this trial, over 5,000 patients uh, with an EF less than 45% who had had a, a hospitalization for heart failure or required outpatient IV diuretics in the prior six months were randomized to verisigwat versus placebo on top of standard GDMT. Again, a primary outcome of CV death or first heart failure hospitalization that was reduced by about 10% relative to placebo. Um, if you look at the secondary outcomes, again, that benefit was uh, mostly from the reduction in heart failure hospitalization. There was not a benefit in terms of CV death or all-cause death. But this drug is now FDA approved to reduce the risk of CV death and heart failure hospitalization. Again, in those patients who've had a recent heart failure hospitalization or a need for outpatient IV diuretics. So this is another um, drug that you can use. There's been some interesting post hoc analyses from Victoria, one of which showing um, sort of the benefit of the drug based on the baseline NT pro BMP level at the time that patients were randomized. And what we saw was that patients in Victoria, number one, had a much higher event rate than some of the prior trials. 
And when you look at the baseline NT pro BNP, it really does help us distinguish the patients who are likely to benefit from varicyclot versus not. So we don't use NT pro BNP in our system, but, but in this analysis, anyway, patients with an NT pro BNP less than 8,000 were the ones who seemed to benefit the most from the add on of varicyclot. So for patients who are really, really sick, as characterized by an elevated NT pro BNP above 8,000, they may not benefit quite as much. We actually are a site for a new trial uh, where we're using varicyglot in perhaps a sicker population that was enrolled in Victoria. So this is a phase three randomized trial um, testing the efficacy and safety of varicyglot in chronic HFRAF EF less than or equal to 40%. Um, so in this patient population, we actually wanna exclude patients who've had a hospitalization or a need for outpatient IV diuretics in the prior six months. So we're sort of looking at a patient population, again, that's less sick than what we saw in Victoria. This will be an event-driven trial with a primary endpoint, again, being a composite of CV death or heart failure hospitalization. I think one of the things that's gonna be exciting about this trial is it, it really will be the first where we see event rates in patients who are on true for drug therapy with a goal that at least about 30% of patients who we enroll should be on an ARNI, and hopefully at least 15% will be prescribed an SGLT2 inhibitor at baseline, and of course we'll see event rates in those patients. We're currently enrolling for this. If you have a patient, again, who's on for drug therapy or having persistent or worsening heart failure symptoms on for, for drug therapy, please call us. Our, our head CRC for our heart failure uh, clinical trials division is Lori Mincy or Alexis Oko. He's my research fellow that can help us sort of establish for you whether patients are eligible for our participation here. And lastly, pertiramer. So this was tested in the Pearl HF study. Again, this is actually an old study. It was published in 2011, but this was a small study of about 100 patients with uh, chronic heart failure who had an indication to receive spironolactone, but had a serum potassium of 4.3 to 5.1 at baseline and had CKD or history or documented hyperkalemia. So they randomized these patients to treatment with spironolactone alone versus spironolactone plus patiromer. And the outcome was actually, again, uh, prevalence or incidence of hyperkalemia, as you might expect. And what patiromer showed is that it significantly reduces the incidence of hyperkalemia in patients who were uh, randomized to patiromer versus placebo. Um, and the proportion of patients who could be up titrated to 50 milligrams a day as spironolactone was higher in those patients who were on patiromer. So I think the take home for this is, um, again, we oftentimes have a reflexive um, sort of clin clinical uh, desire to withdraw MRAs if patients come in with uh, potassiums that are above five, try to avoid that reflex if you can. A, because the guidelines tell us if the potassium is less than 5.3, we don't have to withdraw spironolactone or a plerimone. And two, if they do have documented hyperkalemia, pteromer is a potential add-on for those patients so that they can tolerate their dose of spironolactone. Finally, um, I do want to talk about one drug that's not FDA approved yet, but I hope will be FDA approved within the next couple of years. Um, there's sort of this new terminology for uh, patient or uh, therapeutic compounds that uh, are now classified as mitotropes, calcitropes, and myotropes. So these are therapeutic agents that affect the myocardial contractile apparatus. The calcitropes are the drugs that we're familiar with that we tend to call inotropes, dobutamine, uh, milrinone, DIG, and these drugs work by increasing myocardial force production by altering intracellular calcium. We're familiar with these drugs. We've used them for years, but most of the randomized trials using these drugs, of course, have shown an increase in mortality in patients who are randomized to those drugs. So there are a, a number of other novel compounds that are trying to target the myocardial contractile apparatus without increasing intracellular calcium, one of which is omecanthin macarbal. So this targets myosin in particular, and I'll show you the data for that. This was tested in the galactic uh, heart failure trial. There's also a number of compounds that would fall into the classification of mitotropes. So these are uh, uh, compounds that target mitochondrial energy production. Uh, coenzyme Q10 would fall into that category, even though we know the data for that is probably not as good as we'd like for it to be, but patients are often more willing to take uh, CoQ10 as opposed to some of the other drugs. And there are some newer agents like trimetazine as well as imepratide that we may see some, some newer therapy or data for. So Galactic HF, again, a large trial that randomized patients to omicamptiv macarbal, which again is a selective cardiac myosin activator that in some prior studies like Atomic and others had been shown to improve cardiac function in patients with HFREF. So in Galactic, over 8,000 patients, both inpatient as well as outpatient with an EF less than 35% were randomized to receive omicamptiv or placebo in addition to standard GDMT. Again, about an 8% relative risk reduction when you look at the primary composite, which was uh, heart failure events or CV death, but that uh, primary composite was driven by mainly a reduction in the first heart failure event, which if you look at the p-value sort of just crossed one, no impact on CV death. And interestingly, 
their pre-specified improvement in the KCCQ score as a patient reported outcome actually did not meet uh, the pre-specified um, test for clinical significance. But what's interesting about Omicamptiv is, again, like many of these trials, there's been some important post hoc analyses that have come out since the original publication of um, Galactic. And this is one of them that's shown that perhaps the lower EF, the greater the benefit that these patients get. So when you look at those patients um, who were in the placebo group, the risk of the composite of CV death and heart failure hospitalization was nearly 1.8 higher. And those patients who had an EF less than or equal to 22% based on quartiles compared with those who had an EF greater than or equal to 33% at the time of enrollment. And if you look at the incidence rate of the primary outcome in those patients who were on omicamtib, as the EF gets lower, you can see sort of a clear benefit of omicamtib versus those patients who are enrolled on placebo. Again, sort of put another way, here's the treatment effect of omicamtib. And once you get below an EF of around 25%, we start to see an improving benefit of this drug combination. And actually when they, they looked at this in more detail, <clears throat> there was about a 17% relative risk reduction for those patients who had an EF less than or equal to 22% versus no benefit for patients who had an EF above 33%. So I don't know, um, again, if this drug is gonna be FDA approved, but I think this uh, particular agent might be more beneficial in patients, again, who have a lower EF, more advanced heart failure, but that is to be determined hopefully within the next year or two. So I'm gonna stop there. I don't know if we should stop for questions or I should keep going, um, but we can talk about mildly reduced as well as preserved EF heart failure. So these are the new recommendations for mildly reduced and PEF. Um, this mildly reduced category used to be called borderline heart failure. We're now again calling it mildly reduced. These are patients with an EF between 41 to 49. Um, 2A for SGLT2 inhibitor and a 2B for ACE, ARP, ARNI, MRA, or evidence-based beta blockers. For HEF, PEF patients, the guidelines are relatively similar. Uh, EF greater than or equal to 50%, SGLT2 inhibitors get a 2A. Um, ARNI, MRA, and ARB get a 2B. Note that beta blockers are no longer recommended for HEFPEF. And this is different, right? Because most of our patients with HEFPEF tend to be on beta blockers. I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, is the beta blocker indicated for another reason, right? Like their coronary disease, AFib, or some other reason. But if you're just adding a beta blocker just because they have HEFPEF, that is no longer uh, indicated based on the guidelines. So again, we'll look at the data for SGLT2 inhibitors, which have the highest level of recommendation in both the mildly reduced as well as the PEF space. The first trial that we had was Emperor Preserve, published last year. Um, this was about 6,000 patients, EF greater than 40, um, both type 2 and non-type 2 diabetic, chronic heart failure, GFR greater than or equal to 20. So again, we're sort of pushing the limits of, of what we can do in terms of patient's baseline renal function. Um, and this, again, was looking at the safety and the efficacy of infliflozin versus placebo in patients who had an EF of 40%. Again, you can see that hazard uh, ratio of about a 21% relative risk reduction in patients who were randomized to empagliflozin. Um, and again, we saw that the safety of this drug was, was there. We see improvements in renal function over time, similar to what we've seen in high-risk diabetics, as well as patients with HEFREF, which is important for these patients with HEFPEF, who tend to have a lot of uh, comorbidities like diabetes and CKD and others, where preservation of renal function is actually extremely important. Of course, just two weeks ago at ESC, we saw the publication of DELIVER, Similar study set up over 6,000 patients. It was originally going to randomize 8,000 patients, but the benefits were so clear that that wasn't necessary. EF greater than 40, again, type 2 and non type 2 diabetics, uh, chronic heart failure, GFR greater than or equal to 25, so a little bit lower than uh, DAPA, uh, DAPA HF. Again, randomizing patients to dapagliflozin versus placebo, uh, about an 18% relative risk reduction. Um, again, this was there for patients with or without diabetes. So we now know that we can use dapagliflozin as well as infliflozin safely in patients who have an EF greater than 40 or patients who have an EF less than 40 based on the older trials that I just showed you. As I, as I showed you, the guidelines were clearly tell us that we can still use um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, for patients who can't tolerate an ARNI or can't afford an ARNI. There's been some interesting post hoc analyses that have sort of gone back and looked at the effect of some of these older drugs um, across the spectrum of ejection fraction. I think that's part of the reason why this category of mildly reduced EF heart failure is now getting guideline recommendations where we did not have them before. This is one of those post hoc analyses looking at the benefit of candesartan 
When you look at the primary composite endpoint, again, which was a composite of CV death and heart failure hospitalization, you can actually see the benefits sort of start to accrue once the EF goes below about 50% or so. And if you look at heart failure hospitalization, the same kind of thing over current heart failure hospitalization, uh, when you look at time to first heart failure hospitalization, you start to see this benefit as the EF goes below 50. When you look at recurrent heart failure hospitalization, you actually see that benefit over a wider spectrum of baseline EF range. The same type of analysis has been done with the TOTCAT data, looking at the benefit of spironolactone. Oops. Uh, so when you look at the primary composite outcome, we can see a benefit up to an EF of about 55% or so in patients in top hat who are randomized to spironolactone. Um, and when we look at first heart failure hospitalization, again, that same type of trend where once the EF goes below 55%, we start to see a benefit and that tends to get stronger as the EF goes down. So this idea that patients with a mildly reduced EF between 41 to 49 do benefit from some of these older drug therapies, particularly as the EF falls below the normal range. Of course, Paragon was a randomized trial, EF greater than or equal to 45%. This was published now about two years ago, two or three years ago. Almost 5,000 patients with mildly reduced or HEF-PEF who had elevated natriuretic peptides randomized to sacubitril valsartan versus valsartan, looking at a primary composite of total heart failure hospitalization, CV death. As you know, this trial kind of just missed uh, it, the mark in terms of the primary endpoint, although it was clearly trending and the direction of being positive. There were some secondary endpoints where benefit was shown in terms of a renal composite, as well as improvement in NYHA class. So there, there are some patients who did benefit from randomization to skewbridge valsartan. The other thing that was important here was when we looked at some of the pre-specified subgroups, there seemed to be two subgroups that had clear benefit, women uh, who had a benefit of, uh, of sacubitra valsartan and HEFPEF, and that interaction was statistically significant. And the other group was patients who had an EF below the median at the time of enrollment, which turned out to be 57%. But again, this idea that patients who have an EF sort of below normal may benefit a little bit more than those patients who have an EF above normal. So again, uh, a, a nice post-hoc analysis where they combined patients from Paradigm and Paragon, so sort of across the spectrum of EF, looking at the benefit of sacubitril sartan. And when you look at this benefit, it really does start to accrue sort of once you get in that range of 55% or below, sort of across that spectrum. The other thing that's interesting is if you think about, again, that those pre-specified subgroups, when we look at the benefit for women as compared to men, we see that men probably have a benefit, again, at least based on this post hoc analysis, when the EF is sort of clearly in the mildly reduced range or below, but women actually tend to accrue a benefit maybe all the way up to an EF of 60% or a little bit greater with the thought that what we define as normal EF for men and women may actually differ uh, because women's ventricles are smaller and other factors that we're still understanding from work like Dr. Mehta does and others. So there may be a greater benefit for women uh, with sacubitril valsartan even up to a higher EF range um, than men. So I, that's the data for mildly reduced and PEF. I'll spend the last uh, couple minutes talking about contemporary care of patients with advanced heart failure. So we know, particularly sort of in our healthcare system, that we see a lot of advanced heart failure. This is probably grossly underdiagnosed, but based on the best data that we have among the 6 million patients with heart failure, about 5% per year will progress to advanced or stage D heart failure that's defined by severe signs or symptoms of heart failure at rest intolerance to or being refractory uh, in terms of symptoms despite your best efforts to up titrate and get them on GDMT or recurrent hospitalizations despite them being on good GDMT. And we really wanna think about these patients in that way. So when you look at this sort of new universal definition of heart failure document, for patients who you start on GDMT, particularly thinking about half breath, we wanna sort of think about those patients who improve either in EF or in terms of their symptoms as going into remission, sort of using terminology that's very similar to what we use in the cancer literature. However, for those patients who have persistent signs or symptoms, we wanna be asking ourselves, do these patients have advanced or stage D heart failure? And are those patients who need to be referred to your friendly heart failure uh, cardiologist or, or clinical group? This was one study that looked at sort of how many of these patients have worsening heart failure um, or otherwise sort of progressing towards advanced heart failure and what do, what do clinical outcomes look like for those patients. So this was from the uh, Pinnacle NCDR registry over 11,000 patients who had a new diagnosis of HEFREF between January 1st of 2011 to December 31st of 2014. And in this analysis, they defined worsening heart failure as those who were uh, 30 days out, at least from their initial heart failure diagnosis and had been on therapy for that period. And then had a period of clinical stability where they didn't have any you know, need for an ER visit, a hospitalization or outpatient IV diuretics, 
for over 90 days from their diagnosis, but then subsequently required at least one IV diuretic treatment in any healthcare setting that could have been an ER, an outpatient setting, or a hospital visit. So about 16% of patients actually developed worsening heart failure on average of about one and a half years from diagnosis um, in this patient population. And when you look at uh, predictors of worsening heart failure, older age, black patients are more likely to progress. And we've shown that from some data from, from Emory Healthcare, um, lower EF as well as mo more comorbidities at the time that they were diagnosed with heart failure. But again, when you look at the outcomes, they're really dismal for this patient population. Almost 30% of these patients were dead within two years of, of that uh, worsening heart failure diagnosis. So again, these patients are at extremely high risk for adverse outcomes. So one of the things, if you look at the heart failure literature is that we're really trying to sort of define these patients who have worsening heart failure. We know that oftentimes these patients are initially diagnosed, we put them on good GDMT, their residual risk goes down, and then for whatever reason, they start to progress. And, and many times in the literature, we've sort of defined that progression by a heart failure hospitalization, but we really wanna move back upstream because oftentimes we're seeing worsening heart failure in the outpatient setting, right? Where we're having to up titrate patients' diuretics, we're having to withdraw GDMT because they're now hypotensive or their creatinine has bumped. And so these are the patients who have worsening risk and we really wanna try to refer these patients to advanced heart failure cardiology before we're meeting them in the CCU for the first time on ECMO. So the guidelines now tell us that in patients with advanced heart failure, when it's consistent with the patient's goals of care, that timely referral for heart failure specialty care is recommended to review not only their GDMT, but are they candidates for um, you know, transcatheter mitral valve therapies, or are they suitable for advanced heart failure therapies like LVAD and transplant? This is a scientific statement that I led uh, that was published last year, sort of establishing this concept of what we call the golden window for referral. So there are some patients actually where early referral is absolutely indicated, even if they seem to be doing okay, it might be someone who you're considering, does this patient have cardiac amyloid and you want help, you know, sort of accessing PYP scans or getting into, into myocardial biopsy or other areas, or you might be interested in getting genetic testing for that patient to try to establish sort of what is the true etiology of that patient's heart failure. Of course, we know that many of these patients are unfortunately referred too late when they come to us when they already have cardiac cachexia or they have multi-organ failure, irreversible liver or renal function where instead of evaluating them for heart transplant only, we're evaluating them for dual organ transplant. So what we wanna do is try to sort of move that window upstream and ask clinicians to really think about patients who have persistent symptoms despite optimal GDMT, patients who you're having to down titrate their GDMT because they're no longer tolerating it. Of course, people who've been hospitalized frequently, even those who are having worsening atrial fibrillation or VT, particularly requiring ICD shocks or worsening renal function, those are patients who need to be referred to us, um, ideally in the outpatient setting uh, as opposed to in the inpatient setting. And part of that is because when we talk about these advanced therapies, there's multiple domains of varying importance to individuals who would be classified as having worsening or even advanced heart failure. Of course, when we look at the data, oftentimes we're sort of uh, looking at survival as the most important domain. But one of the things that of course patients think about is the burden of these therapies. They're costly, they're, they're not cheap, particularly when we talk about transplant and VAD. When we think about some of the associated medical therapies that we need to maintain the longevity of those therapies. Um, of course, there's caregiver or care partner burden, and this can be a really difficult thing for many of our patients, particularly for those who are in the younger age, age ranges where they may not have spouses who are retired or other factors. And then of course, quality of life. So many of our patients are sort of thinking about that or transplant um, as, a, as a potential survival benefit, but often what that does to all of these other domains. And it can be very difficult to have these conversations with patients in an inpatient setting. So the idea of course, is that it's much nicer if we're having a conversation that looks like this in the outpatient setting and getting patients to think about those factors even before they've progressed to requiring inotropes versus like this, where we meet many of our patients for the first time in the CCU. Um, I just wanted to put this data up there. This was actually published, I think, just last week. This was uh, this is the, sort of the newest analysis from the Momentum trial, which randomized patients to the HeartMate 3 versus the older Axial Flow HeartMate 2, which we, we really don't use anymore, although we have a few patients in our system who are still uh, being supported with a HeartMate 2. But I think you know many of us probably still have the concept that these devices are associated with very high morbidity and mortality. 
And, and actually, if you look at the data, the one-year outcomes for the HeartMAID 3 in many patients are actually as good as transplant, over 90% one-year survival. And when you look at five-year outcomes, which is the most recent analysis that was done from this trial, uh, if you look at overall survival, it's about 58% for patients who are randomized to the HeartMAID 3 versus the HeartMAID 2, where it's still about 43%. So again, much better than survival with inotropes or, or GDMT. If you look at event-free survival, which include uh, sort of device therapy or stroke, it's about 54%. So so um, we really want to think about referring these patients for advanced therapy sooner. I don't know that this needs to be said to anybody in this audience, but some clinical clues, again, that a patient may have advanced heart failure, persistent symptoms, greater than two ER visits or hospitalizations for acute heart failure in the prior 12 months. So I think this is one of the areas that we probably are desensitized because we do see a lot of worsening heart failure where patients get hospitalized, but if someone is being hospitalized frequently, they really um, should be referred to us again, either in the outpatient setting or a console in the inpatient setting. But even for those patients who've never been hospitalized, high-risk biomarker profile, very persistently elevated troponins or BMPs or anti-proBMPs, again, inability to uptitrate GDMT because of hypotension, dizziness, worsening renal function, um, onset of arrhythmias like AFib, VT, certainly those patients who are being shocked by their ICD. Patients who are on very high doses of diuretics or you're continuing to uptight diuretics and they're still persistently edematous. And of course, anybody who's had a prayer need for IV inotropes. There was an um, acronym that was published a couple of years ago, I Need Help. Um, some people don't like this acronym, but if you're someone who does, some of the fellows really like this, this is another way to sort of help think about um, these patients who need to be referred. So um, just in conclusion, uh, heart failure has really changed. The, the things that we have to offer patients, because I didn't talk about, you know, again, transcatheter valve therapies, uh, iron deficiency or treatment of IV iron. There's a lot of things that we have to offer patients with heart failure. Um, and I think that this landscape is going to continue to evolve. Um, for patients with uh, uh, heart failure defined by stage C, remember if they have HEFREF, that ARNI plus evidence-based beta blocker, MRA and SGLT2 inhibitor, are now considered foundational therapy for those patients, and that we are seeing a benefit of the RNA as well as the SGLT2 inhibitors across the spectrum of EF, including those patients who have fallen to a mildly reduced or a preserved EF category. And then finally, for those patients who have advanced or worsening heart failure, please consider the referring them to heart failure specialists, uh, assuming that's consistent with their goals of care. So I'll stop there because I wanted to leave some time for questions. And that's it. Thank you, Dr. Morris, for that outstanding uh, talk and for getting us up to date on these guidelines. Um, go ahead and start asking questions. Go ahead. So I have two questions. I have 500 questions <laughs> I want to ask you too. Um, so one is about the uh, Victoria study where you showed the, the post-hoc analysis showed the pro, uh, the NT-pro BNP was low. I mean, how, why does that? Well, well so what's the mechanism whereby people with a lower NT pro BNP? So I think the thought is that if you look at the event rate for patients, even in the placebo group in Victoria, it's substantially higher than some of the more recent contemporary trials like DAPA, HF, and Paradigm. So the idea was that by defining a patient population that had, had a recent need for outpatient IV diuretics or a heart failure hospitalization, we were capturing patients that were sicker than those who had been enrolled in the more recent contemporary trials. So I think the idea is that if you use natriuretic peptides as a marker of worsening or advanced heart failure, that those patients who have very, very high natriuretic peptide levels are sicker and may not benefit from a therapy like verisiquat. Again, those may be patients who need to be referred for advanced therapies like VAT or transplant. So that's the idea of why they're trying to sort of do VICTOR, which is a trial that may uh, simulate a patient population that's a little bit closer to what we saw in trials like DAP, HF, and for reduced or paradigm. I think the bottom line is patients in Victoria were sicker. Yeah, too sick. Okay. And then the second question is, so after you showed us all the post hoc data for HEF, HEF, Mm -hmm. you know, with the traditional therapies. Mm -hmm. So should those really be sort of 2A, 2B sort of things? Yeah. You know, what should we do? Depends on if you're a purist. Because a those, those things drugs. start looking less attractive. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons, I think, to be aware of those um, treatment paradigms. Number one, particularly for mildly reduced EF, there, there were really no guidelines in the past. Um, I think the other thing is, as we were talking about before, is that the reality of the matter is that these newer drugs are expensive. And I have plenty of patients, particularly those who are on Medicare, where I've started them on the SGLT2 and Inhibitor. Once they fall into the donut hole, the price gets jacked up. It's really hard to ask a patient to pay $500 a month for a medication, right? Um, and I have patients who've had very odd idiosyncratic side effects on SGLT2 inhibitors. I've had one woman who had a rash. 
other people, other non-diabetic women who have horrible yeast infections on those drugs. So I think the reality is that even though the guidelines tell us to do this, implementing it in clinical practice is a different beast for a variety of reasons. And so for those patients who either don't tolerate it or can't afford it, there are still a host of other drugs that we can still use that clearly have decades worth of data. And based on these post hoc analyses, they have benefit. But I think if you think about it from the perspective of the people who are writing the guidelines, um, it, my takeaway is that if there's not a benefit in terms of CV death, it's falling into the 2B category. And if there's not, um, if the benefit is based on post hoc analyses, they're, they're getting a 2B. So uh, I tell you, it frightens patients to hear that they have heart failure. So actually, when you're in the room talking with them, you probably don't say, well, do you know you have heart failure? Yeah. You probably skirt around that. Yeah. Of course, in your notes, you write that they have heart failure. Right. And then they go read their note like right. they can nowadays and say, do I have heart failure? Mm -hmm. And uh, once upon a time, we had a book around the corner uh, that you guys wrote. Uh, the title of it was Heart Failure. We changed that to a stronger pump, a stronger pump. Mm. Now we've changed it again, I'm pretty sure. So uh, I always like when making rounds to tell the house officers to give them that book, which has all these drugs in them needs to be updated, you might want to do that. Mm. Uh, but they never know what the book is. Mm -hmm. So uh, education of these people that are in numerous times is important. Uh, also, uh, one of the first paragraphs of all of our papers that are on heart failure probably should say, you know, we're talking about the left ventricular myocardium. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure and I don't know how the how internists and family practitioners deal with this anymore because it's it's in, what you presented today was impressive. Uh, I don't know how they're going to be able to navigate through this, mm -hmm. and especially the first thing they need to do is to make sure that underlying things are not there, such as aortic stenosis, yeah. such as left main disease, yeah. uh, such as mitral regurgitation that has gone advanced, yep. such as even pulmonary hypertension, an atrial septal defect. So uh, I, I don't see that very often, yep. but I think we always need to put that at the very first when we're talking about uh, heart failure. Yeah. So I thanks for that detailed presentation. And uh, I think it's your turn. You're, you're right, just a couple of comments. Number one, I think it's important to realize that all of these data, right, is looking at patients who have severe LV function in terms of treating severe RV function, we really have a dearth of drugs where we have benefit for that. And I think that's important because we know that many of our patients with HFPEF in particular actually have pulmonary hypertension and results in RV failure that really contributes to their worsening symptoms. So that's one thing. But the other thing to your earlier comment is if you look at sort of, you know, cardio Twitter and all of these spaces, there really has been a movement to get away from saying heart failure and calling our teams heart function teams or heart success teams. I think Monjokadar was probably one of the first that used to do that, at least when I was a fellow when we were rounding, because patients, you know, they, they get scared when you tell them that they have heart failure, then they go home and they Google and they see that they have a 50% mortality within five years. I mean, I'm sure Andy has patients who he's been treating who have heart failure that are older than I am or have had heart failure for longer than I have. So that's part of the difficulty with this condition is, there's the data, but then there are clearly patients who sort of outlive the data and have a much better prognosis than what we see based on epidemiologic cohort data, but it is what it is. So just a couple of comments about talking to patients is uh, one, um, patients ask us, well, what does this medicine do? And the answer needs to be, it makes you feel better, prevents you from being hospitalized, and it makes you live longer, uh, rather than getting into some mechanism of of treatment. Um, people don't ask their oncologist, can you tell me the exact mechanism of this chemotherapeutic drug? So keep that in mind when we're talking to patients. You mentioned adjusting medicines like SGLT2, uh, adjusting their diabetes therapy, but one of the key things in managing these patients um, is adjusting their diuretic therapy and mm -hmm. decreasing the diuretics. So the SGLT2 
inhibitors have a diuretic effect. So Kipitril valsartan has a diuretic effect. So often either stopping diuretics in someone who's on a low dose yeah. can be quite important. Um, recognize that in the clinical trials, there's quite a bit of intolerance to these, some of these medicines. So, so Kipitril valsartan, I think there was a dropout of 20% or so right. of patients didn't tolerate it due to hypotension. Um, when you're going with a four drug regimen, just be careful with that. Um, and, uh, and another point is just some of the guidelines are not based upon true clinical trial data. So I'm not aware of data in NYHA class one patients who've never been hospitalized to go on an MRA, to go on spironolactone, yep. you know. That, that trial was done with patients who were hospitalized. So a lot of the jump on this guideline for drug deal is related to the sicker patients who've been hospitalized and that type of thing. Um, and when we're seeing patients who are out running five miles, they're on an ACE inhibitor, they're on a beta blocker, they don't have any symptoms, they have a normal BNP level, does that patient need to be on a four drug regimen? I don't think so. But, but what happens is they come into clinic, see another provider, and suddenly they're starting to get on these four drugs. And I would just say that I think there's still a role for thinking uh, and knowing what the clinical trial data was. Um, and then just a, a final thing is this focus on ejection fraction gets really quirky, you know, and um, there are other things we need to look at left ventricular diameter, all of that, as we decide if a patient is stable or not. Um, and we also need to look at the underlying cause, particularly in HEFPEF. Mm -hmm. And one of the main underlying cause in HEFPEF is obesity. And, you know, it may well be shown in the future that maybe the GPLP1 agonist that may cause dramatic weight loss may be the treatment for HEFPEF. For HEFPEF. So yeah. there, there's still a role for looking at the underlying cause. And then just a final thing is that we've been involved in a trial where Neil Dickert would give us a sheet of what the patient's actual insurance would cover for the medicines, which is dramatically helpful in management. They have to get a third party to give us that information. But sometimes you might prescribe, uh, you know, I'll just mention the trade names. You may prescribe Jardiants and it, it may be that Farsiga is better covered or the other way around. So patient may come back and say, well, that medicine costs 200 bucks a month, whereas it may cost them $40 a month. So all of this has gotten very, um, you know, complex. Yeah. And then just a final comment would be that I see people call heart failure with recovered ejection fraction, HEFPEF, and it's not HEFPEF. So is this word that beta blockers don't help HEFPEF? If you went from an EF of 20 to normal, that's not HEFPEF, and it doesn't mean you can stop that's right. The beta blocker. You need That's to keep right. them on it forever. That's right. When we're now calling it, we're not even calling it recovered EF. We're calling it heart failure with improved EF with the idea that they're always, right? If you slice that hard into the microscope and look histologically, it's not normal ejection fraction. So that's exactly why you do not take those patients off of drugs unless there's some really good reason to do so. 50% right? Are you a glass half full or a glass half <laughs> empty person? <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, I, you, you know, it is, but, and so I think that's, that's exactly right. It's funny. Cause I called Andy like a few weeks ago about a guy who I saw in consult who'd had COVID recently and had an EF presumably drop in the setting of that, but within like days, his EF was back up to normal. And so I think that you have to use your clinical judgment, right? We have guidelines in this, that there's the application. He was 20 something years old. Was I going to leave him on four drug therapy for life? That's a really hard thing to commit someone to. Um, but I think there's a lot of patients again, who <clears throat> were really sick at the time that they were diagnosed and then had improvement in their EF. And I think the idea is that we, they're not have PEF, they're not normal EF. We don't want to mess with those. So, you know, we're always around, I think is the bottom line. It's, this is something that we're still learning as heart failure clinicians because it's changed really rapidly. Um, and as you all said, especially in primary care spaces, internal spaces, even general cardiology, I think this is something that's gonna be a moving target. There's gonna be other new drugs within the next couple of years. So our, our knowledge base is gonna continue to expand. And the question of course is, is implementation, how to do this right. A lot of can take one question. On, on the Hello? Alana, this is uh, Abby Goyle. So just, I'm just wondering now with four drugs being recommended, 
for goal-directed medical therapy, a patient who comes in with heart failure reduced EF de novo in the hospital, mm -hmm. it seems impractical to me to just start them on four meds right off the bat yeah. in the hospital. I mean, the likelihood there's data on compliance that every medicine you put on, you know, once you get to a certain number, the, the likelihood that they're going to take all of them just begins to drop precipitously. So, you know, some practical, uh, looking for some practical advice, you know, what, what do you recommend for someone who's naive to all heart failure drugs oh, who see. comes in and uh, what's a reasonable number to start them on in the hospital? And then what should be the follow-up plan for those patients so that they can be up titrated or have more added on? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really interesting question, Abby, and it, it's, it can be difficult. And I think for me, it depends on uh, the factors that we always look at, like, like renal function, blood pressure, et cetera. If someone's hovering with a blood pressure in the 90s, the idea that they're going to tolerate ARNI is, is, is maybe not, the likelihood that they're going to tolerate that is not high. What I try to do in terms of my clinical practice, when patients are in the hospital and they're still a little bit wet, but not, uh, you know, sort of super duper wet, I think initiation of the ARNI when patients are a little hypervolemic may be safe safer than when they're bone dry. If you try to put someone in an ARNI when you completely diurese them, their creatinine's already bumped, there is a high likelihood that they're going to get hypotensive and end up in the unit for a couple of days. And I've done that. Um, you know, you can ask my team. So I think we have to be aware, as, as Andy said, that hypotension is the most common side effect, particularly for patients who are, are already sort of hypotensive or teetering or who have labile renal function that starting them on the ARNI in the setting of the hospitalization may not be the right thing to do. Maybe waiting until later is a better time versus if someone once sort of euvolemic, maybe starting the beta blocker at very low dose before they leave the hospital and the SGLT2 inhibitor, knowing that you're going to see a decline in a GFR after you start an SGLT2 inhibitor, no matter what, that's sort of been shown in all the high-risk diabetes trials, the heart failure trials, as well as the CKD trials. There's this characteristic dip in the GFR that usually normalizes after six to eight weeks of therapy. So that sort of slide that I showed you on titration of therapy, some people think maybe starting the beta blocker and the SGLT2 inhibitor first because the SGLT2 inhibitors, at least in HEFREF, have been shown to be relatively hemodynamically neutral, which is interesting because in the CKD and diabetes trials, they're associated with blood pressure lowering. But in emperor reduced in DAPA-HF, for the most part, patients' blood pressure stay okay. 10 milligrams a day, you start it, you forget it, don't check labs. And most patients tolerate the SGLT2 inhibitors pretty well. And then coming back perhaps in a couple of weeks and adding the MRA and or the ARNI sort of at the end when patients are sort of out of that really acute sick phase. I think the, the, the idea and the real take home is to not wait a year, right? So if someone gets hospitalized, they come back for their 10 day or seven to 10 day post-discharge visit. Maybe you add a third drug and then you make a, an appointment with them in another two weeks to a month and add the fourth drug at that time, assuming they can tolerate it. But what the data shows is that we don't do that as clinicians, that patients don't have their drugs titrated and they don't have drugs added. And you can look out to six months, a year, two years, and patients are on the same stuff that they were on when they got hospitalized two years before. So the idea is that we should always be actively challenging patients and seeing if they can tolerate these drugs. If they don't tolerate it, they just don't. I've got plenty of patients so I tried on Entresto, they got hypotensive or they felt really fatigued and I put them back on an ACE or an ARB. So I think that that's, that's okay to do. Uh, Alana, this is Dan Veer calling in. Can you hear me? I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what to do about the patient who appears who has had heart failure is compensated and it's euvolemic, but still has low level of BNP elevation, say 300 to 400 range. You know, and you're seeing them in the office and the PCP has referred that back to you. So what to do with that kind of patient? So I think that it depends on how you think they're doing. So, so a couple of things, and this slide got cut off for some reason, but there, there was another document that was published in early 2021, sort of establishing this concept of the universal definition of heart failure based on BNP levels. And a BNP over 35 is actually diagnostic of heart failure at this time. So it's no longer BNP greater than or equal to 100, it's a BNP over 35, with the acknowledgement that there's lots of confounders, right? Patient's body weight, do they have HEFPEF, what is their renal function? But if their BMP is three or 400, that's actually quite high since 35 is the cutoff now for what defines heart failure in an ambulatory setting. So that's number one. But I think, you know, as Andy said, some of these patients are, are doing okay. I don't want to say they're clinically stable because we know that the risk for progression in many of these patients is very high. But for a patient who's exercising, is walking, seems functional, that may be a patient that you follow closely and see back frequently, and you're not necessarily, you know, sort of doing super aggressive maneuvers to try to figure out what's going on. Obviously, in heart failure clinic, that's not the majority of our patients, but in, in Gen Card's clinic, you might have 
a lot of patients that look like that. That being said, if patients do have a persistently elevated BMP or troponin, despite your um, you know, sort of attempts to optimize, there's, there's room, right, to get patients on more drugs, particularly if they have other comorbidities. So I think the question, of course, is, do you, are you sitting in front of a patient who's got mildly reduced EF and their BNP is 300, but they also have CKD and they also have diabetes and they're not on an SGLT2 inhibitor. There are so many of those patients like that out here. So the heart failure is only one reason to start dapagliflozin or infliflozin. They've got two other reasons to be on those drugs, including their CKD and their diabetes. So I think that's a lot of what I do, even for patients who look to be doing okay. The other point is that in all of the trials that I showed you, the vast majority of the patients in those trials were actually NYHA2. So 70 to 80% of those patients are NYHA2. They're not NYHA3 or 4. They're actually patients who we look at in an outpatient setting and say, hey, you're doing okay. And yet still, you know, within two years, 30% of those patients are dead. So I think, again, sort of constantly reestablish what is that patient's risk profile, really pushing them in terms of understanding their symptoms, looking at their spouse or their care partner to say, are they really able to walk around Walmart, are they getting short of breath? I mean, I think those are the things that we're gonna to have to do because there's a lot of room to optimize GDMT and many of our patients have other comorbidities that would warrant addition of some of these drugs. Thank you. Dr. King, did you ask your question? Okay. Okay, great, thank you so much. And don't forget to get your CME. So you have to go online and click to get, to get your credit. Thank you. I'll see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.